Okay, good morning, everyone. And this is the formal start for our lesson one and uh, for the full course of, of our English reading for international affairs. And I believe that you are waiting for this moment for the second week before the second. It, it's kind of exciting. Uh, today we will talk about uh, life insurance terrorists and the suicide bombers. Uh, this is a very strange correlation among these three elements, right? If you want to uh, commit suicide, you know for sure, it's a common sense, you will not get paid if you buy life insurance. And you commit suicide, no one will give you the money, say, I'm sorry, you killed yourself. So this is a huge amount of money to compensate your loss. No, that is not the case. So, but now, if you look at the title of lesson one, why should suicide bombers buy life insurance? This strongly indicates that we definitely need to buy life insurance if you want to commit suicide. The key issue here is why we need to buy. Okay, you will get the answers up here. And it's kind of interesting. Okay, so let's move to the next slide. This is our outline of the lecture. So normally, I will be in the beginning of each lesson, you will have the outline of the lecture. So you will be able to understand what you can expect from this lecture. And also, I have, post, I have posted the PPT file to you uh, yesterday. So if you want to preview some of the contents, you can just download the file and keep it so that you can get familiar to the lecture in advance. Instead of just come here and just sit here and just enjoy the lecture. Okay, you can do something by yourself. First one, you will be able to learn the story explaining why terrorists need to buy life insurance. Even you want to become a terrorist, it would be a good idea for you to buy life insurance. Of course, the purpose of buying such insurance is not to get paid, but to hide your own identity. So this is a good reason for doing this. And after the lecture, I will give you the English etymology. Etymology, the origin of words. So the origin of English words we know if you want to learn English vocabulary from the very beginning of your learning English, uh, let's say starting from some students started from three years old, some students started from uh, let's say uh, seven years old, the first year of primary school, and for myself, I formally started my learning English at the age of 13. So not quite early, right? But still, I can learn and you can learn that too. But how can you memorize all of these different words? A college student, uh, it is said, if you want to master uh, English proficiency in reading, a college student should be able to know at least around 15,000 English words. This is the amount of vocabulary you need to know. How many of you you know so far? Well, for native speakers, that is not an issue. But uh, for students from Taiwan, from Japan, from uh, non-native speaking countries, that is quite a uh, problem. So you really want to know, how can you increase your word power? Is that right? Increasing your word power is very, very important. One way to increase your word power, to know a lot of vocabulary, significantly just a great leap in your vocabulary archive, is to understand the etymology of the English words. How can you learn this? You need to learn English roots. English are coming out from Latin Greek roots a lot of the time. For example, you must know the word biology. Is that right? Anyone here know the word biology? Okay, well, this is too difficult to see. 
Okay, biology, you know, this is biology because we have to learn this subject. When we were in high school, junior high, right? We, we dissect <laughs> anatomy of the, the frog, poor frog lying on the bed. So you just cut it. So this is, is part of biology. So biology, yes, you can memorize this word, fine. But if you know, if you know, biology actually come out from two roots. One is bio. Bio and the other one is allergy. Bio means life. And the allergy means the study of. So the study of life, of course, is biology. It's very easy, right? And how about biography? Biography, did you notice that there are some similarity? There is one similarity between bio and this bio, right? Life. And how about gray phi? Graph means something written. Y indicate a system of writing. So biography is a writing for life. Zhuanji, is that right? Okay, so if you know biography, if you can add in some another components for this, how about auto? Autobiography as one word. So we know this is something written for life, right? How about auto? What is the meaning for auto? The meaning for auto is not automobile, it's self. It is self, yourself. So this is a life story about yourself in Chinese, zi zhuan. Okay, so we have auto, and then we could add in another component to have, let's say, automobile, just as I said. Automobile, we know it is a car, a vehicle, right? Uh, you you re memorize it all the time, it's quite easy. But how about MOB? M O B. M O B, M O V, and O M O T means move. So automobile is something can move by itself. So it is a car, it's a vehicle. Okay? So if you know Latin roots, then that will be much easier for you to know how to expand your knowledge for English vocabulary. Well, lucky for us, actually in the whole wide world, there are only around, there are only around 400 commonly used Latin and Greek roots you need to learn, only 400. And after you learn these 400 Latin or Greek roots, how many words you can master and so that you don't need to remember and you look at it, oh, I know you. How many? Could you get a guess? Anyone can raise your hand? Oh, you could just simply type here. How many words you can think? 400 and then how many words you could identify without difficulty? How many words? Come on, type in, type in. Here, let me show you. As a roll call, you have to type something. This is the first roll call for you, you have to type. Roll call, 点名, and type in your answer right now. So this is the first roll call, so you have to type in your answers, so I can identify your name and your answers all together. <coughs> so after you learn the 400, master the knowledge for 400 Latin and Greek words, and then how many English words you don't need to learn and you look at them and you know the meaning of those words. And this serves as the purpose for the first roll call, so you need to type in, or otherwise you are not here. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to end this roll call in 10 seconds.
So after I end the roll call and you did not type in your answers, then you are not here. And then you will be marked as absent for this class, for the first hour of this class. Okay, so please provide your answer right now. Otherwise, you are not here. Okay, so the end of the first roll call. Okay, so this is the ground rule for our class management, very easy. So I don't want to have the roll call one by one, hey, you, are you here or you no? I don't want to do that. I want you to provide your answers sometime. I want you to type in your school ID or name sometime. I want to get some input in the classroom, into a night group, so I can know you, you are here. Okay, so, okay, uh, that's good. Um, there's one student here. Who is who want to join? You are here already, right? Okay, thank you. Okay, that should be no problem. Okay, we shall continue. Okay, you will be surprised to find out the knowledge of 400 Latin and Greek words will help you to master, manage the knowledge of 40,000 words. That's it. So do you want to memorize 40,000 words or instead you just try to work on 400 Latin or English roots, Latin root, Greek roots? The answer, of course, is definitely 400. Is that right? 400. So that's why we want to, in this class, the department wants you to understand the English etymology. And the other side is the sentence structure. Today we will talk about the sentence structure. You will be amazed to find out all English sentences, all, all English sentences can be classified into 10 different sentence patterns, period. No exception, only, no exception. So you will be able to learn this. This sentence structure is part of the logic of grammar. You definitely need to know. Okay, so after our class, we will learn some grammar, some English vocabulary, and also by the end, we have an assignment for you. So this is complete sequence of our lecture for today. So any questions so far? So if not, we'll continue to the last part. So here is a very profound but serious question. A terrorist buying an insurance policy? When you ask your friend about this question, and definitely most of the students will get the answer for, of course not, no, serious. The student, your friends will, will, will respond to you, serious, buying life insurance? You want to become a terrorist and you want to buy life insurance, why? No, of course not, no, because there are some good reasons for doing, for not buying life insurance, right? For example, you are busy. If you were the terrorist, you would busy, be busy in building bombs. <laughs> you want to have a lot of bombs up there, right? So you don't have the time to go to a life insurance agency and contact the agents to buy life insurance for first one. And the second one, you don't want your name to be known by others. So you want to keep him, you want to, want to keep anonymous by others. So look here, what is the meaning for anonymous? Anyone here knows the meaning for anonymous? Anyone? Yeah, you, out, yeah I know, you know. Anyone here from Taiwan know or Japan knows? Anonymous. Okay, how about this? I'll give you another try, anonymous. You can do this one more time. What is the meaning for anonymous? For this one, this beautiful words, roots. Where is the?
Okay, what is the meaning of anonymous? Do you know? You can type in as a Okay, uh, anonymous is not to be unknown, but rather is uh, nameless. It's uh, without name identified. It's not unknown. It's not unknown. <laughs> it's not unknown, but why do you want to continue? To <laughs> without a name, great. Yes, it is without a name. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Uh, okay, let's uh, come here. So you will be surprised to find out, I say it is not unknown. <laughs> it is unidentifiable without a name, yet it is indeed. Okay, let me tell you why it is anonymous. Actually, you don't have to remember anonymous. Anonymous, because the only thing you need to know is root. Okay, let me tell you why. Did you know O N Y M means name? O N Y M. There's another name root. That is, uh, let me give you one. N O M I N and O N Y M. Both roots refers to name. Name. So if I nominate you. As, oops, sorry, it's A-T-E. So if I nominate you as the leader of this class, what do I do? I action on the giving the name of you to the other students, say, let's, let's elect him, let's vote him for the leaders as the leaders of the class, right? So nominate, T-Ming, very simple, okay? And anonymous, we know this one is name, right? So look here, this is name. O-U-S refers to the adjective. This is the ending, the suffix for adjective, of. And A-N means no. So anonymous means of no name. That's it. So it would be much better for you to, to, to work on roots instead of remember this strange combination, anonymous. Is that right? So keeping anonymous is one of the major concerns for being a terrorist. You want to be known, you don't want to be known by the authority, right? So you want to hide your name. And uh, the most important reasons for not buying life insurance, of course, because you are you are never you will be never get paid. It doesn't matter how much premium you pay to the life insurance agency, you will not get paid at all. Is that right? So look here, the three good reasons here indicate one very simple fact. Buying life insurance is not an option for a terrorist. But sometime the author of this article would argue that yes, you should buy. You should. Just for one very simple reason. That is, you could avoid being marked as a potential terrorist. You buy life insurance and people will think that you are a rational person. So since you are rational, you are a person with reason. Then you buy life insurance, you want to get paid if you die. So ideally, theoretically, you will not con con commit suicide by blowing yourself with a bomb, right? So if you really want to buy, if you really want to be a terrorist, go buy a life insurance. Okay, so here is the first argument for a terrorist buying a life, a life insurance policy. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. So here comes out the real story. The, this is the introductory paragraphs for, the, for this article. It was a story, but it, is a real, it was a real story. It happened in 2005 in London. On that year, July 7th, 
So we see four Islamic suicide bombers blasted themselves. Boom. And four, of course, four blasting and killing 52. So using four people to a full exchange of 52 casualties, well, it's, we, we cannot say that it's quite a deal, but it's a, certainly a tragedy. And uh, after the bombing, there's one person, one figure called Ian Hosley. Ian Hosley recalled, remorseful means so sad. The sad and regretful Ian Hosley recalled, tried to say something and remember, and he said, quote, personally, I was devastated by it. I feel so sorry. Why? I feel so sad. Why? You are not involved in the terrorist attack, right? And you are not the police force, one of the police force. Why do you feel sorry about this? And he continued to say, we were just starting to work on identifying terrorists. We do, we did have a program, and this project is working on to help the authority to identify the potential terrorists. And uh, this gave up some eyebrow, raising our eyebrow. Wow, what is that? Tell us more. But before that, Ian Hosley continued to say, he said, and I thought maybe, just maybe, when we talk about maybe, it's less than 30% of the chances. Very slim chance, but there's a chance out there, right? And I thought maybe, just maybe, if we had started a couple years earlier, would we have stopped it? This hypothesis, this presumptional statement indicate that it did not happen at all. It did not start a few years earlier, right? So it says, if we had started a couple years earlier, would we have stopped it? It means that they did not stop the happening. They did not. But Ian Hosley definitely hoped that if he could, if he could start the project a little bit earlier, then the project may be there and will be used to prevent the terrorist attack. Is that right? Sounds like a good idea. It seems that you have something you are, pre you, are doing, uh, on, you are doing on some project, and you know the potential contribution of the project to do to prevent some disaster, but the disaster just happened. You feel so sorry about this. And this happened to Ian Hosley. Okay, so let's look at the project, of course. The project seems very, very powerful, right? Okay, so what about Hosley's terrorist detection project? Well, basically, let's see this one. This July 7 bomber's banking data, those terrorists for only four, those terrorist banking data led to the arrest of 100 plus suspects in a few months. So imagine this. There are four, there were four terrorists committing suicide bomb. They blasted themselves. And with the clues provided from their banking data, the police were able to arrest around 100 or so, about 100 suspects in just a few months. So this kind of banking data, will that be helpful for Ian Hosley to build up his own project? Yes, this, this refers to this set of banking data, helped construct the project. So let's look at the process of the construction for this project. First of all, Ian Hosley and his team has assembled the data. Assembled the data, assembled all the available data on these 100 plus subjects. Those subjects, they have their banking data too, right? So basically, the police arrest these subjects, these, these suspects, and they use their banking data 
all coming out to their computer, their PC, their computing system, okay, assembled together. And then the next step is to create an algorithm. What is the algorithm? It's a formula. It's a formula, a mathematical formula, something like this. So when we say formula, it's something like y equal to a x plus b. This is one of the formula. So that something like this. So we say this is a mathematic mathematical formulas. But algorithm consists a lot of mathematical formulas. So you can step one, step two, step four, three, four, five, six. Eventually, it's a collection of mathematical formula to serve, to create, to function, to, to serve at some specific function. So the function of this algorithm, Yan Shuan Shi, is to create, to try to help Yan Hosley and his team to identify. So identify the terrorists. So this, the hundred of so data is used to create an algorithm to set this man apart from the general population. So let's think about this one. Let me give you one very simple example. So this is the whole set of the customers in the bank. And this is the bunch, small bunch of the terrorists, suspects arrested by the police, right? They have their banking data. And the others have their banking data. So by collecting this set of banking data, then Ian Hosley and his team is able to use this to set apart the banking data of other non-suspects of committing terrorists, right? So this one can help by collecting this small batch of the banking data. So here, we know this small set of banking data can help to set this man apart from the general population because their banking data are unique. Unique in a way that very different from the banking data of the general public. Okay, so they use this banking data to create an algorithm. Okay, and then the next one is to dredge banks database. Dredge, dredge means to sift and sort use the algorithm to go through all the different database and try to identify which one is very similar to the traits of this algorithm. So use the algorithm to trace through the bank's database to identify other potential bad guys. Very simple. Let me use this one more time to give you a good idea about how they accomplish this task. Okay. Here is the banking data. And uh, some of the terrorists were arrested. Some of them were arrested, right? And now they have a specific banking behavior. Banking behavior. And then the Yan Hosley and his team use this kind of banking data to create an algorithm and then use the algorithm to dredge, to sift through all the other data and going just like a bumblebee, da da di da 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 di da da. Oh, this is a bad guy with a similar traits over here. This one. And continue to search, da da then. Continue to search another one, another one, get through all the different parts, and this is another one. Oh, this is one. So basically, this algorithm, based on the database, can be helpful to identify some other banking data with similar traits. So once identified, then the police force will say, okay, 
this is the potential terrorist out there. We should catch him and get into the prison and interrogate to see whether he or she is a real terrorist or not. And this one too, right? So basically, these people were already arrested by the police. Use the data here. The team created an algorithm and use the algorithm to go through all the other data and identify the bad guy here. This is the idea of the algorithm. This is the idea of the project, right? Okay, it sounds like a very good plan. Okay, let's continue. So what we have? So before we could know about what we have, we need to identify what is the algorithm about. We know the algorithm, algorithm come out, comes out from the available data bank, banking data of those subject, right? Suspect. And then what is the algorithm? It's so magic, then what is it? Okay, let's try to identify the major component of the algorithm. First of all, this is the process. First part, there are some positive indicators inside the algorithm. Some of them are as follows. First one, all the suspects reveal in their banking data, most of them have monthly names. If they are no, then one out of 500,000 is a subject. But either first or last name, then one out of 30,000. If both names are monthly names, then <laughs> you are every 2,000 banking customers, one out of 2,000 may be able to be identified as a terrorist. So if you want to disguise yourself, you may want to change your name to something not so Muslim, okay? You can do that. Uh, for example, Ling, Chinese, and uh, Daniel, American. <laughs> so that would be quite safe. So I, I'll, be, I'll, be fall, I'll be falling into this category. One out of 500,000 is a very good chance to hide, to hide me away from the scrutiny, the, uh, the scrutiny of the police, right? So first, the first positive indicator is monthly names first. And how about the second one? Man, <laughs> the gender difference does tell something. Most of the terrorists were uh, men, so the men sitting in this classroom, you watch out you have a higher chance of being a terrorist, identified as a terrorist. And the age is too. Age is another positive indicator. If you are somewhere between 26 and 35, you have a higher probability of being a terrorist. And I'm beyond that. Most of the student is below that, so we are quite safe. But I see some faces showing that, oh, I'm, uh, I'm in the, I'm the age group, oh my goodness. So 26 to 35 is something you have to look at. And the next one is owning a mobile phone instead of landline phone. So we, we do have a mobile phone, right? So uh, that's increase our chance of becoming a terrorist. And how about the other one is being a student. <laughs> so all students here, you are suspects, right? So students, mobile phone, the age between 26 and 35, and the gender is male. And the last positive indicators is renting rather than owning a house. That's quite reasonable, right? Because you don't want to buy a house, you want to die if you want to die eventually. So you will rent. So if you are a male student, with the master name, two names, surname and uh, your first name. And then you are within the age of 25 and 36, and you are exchange student to uh, some other countries, and then you rent a house, and you with, with disposable mobile phone, <laughs> and then you have a very, very high chance of being identified as a terrorist. 
Okay, so these are the positive, positive indicators inside the algorithm. Of course, we do not know the real combination, real formula of these algorithms. But we could, we are able to understand some of the major positive indicators so far. Okay, so let's take a 10 minutes break and come back again. <coughs> so for now we have identified the positive indicators for the major components of this algorithm. We know this algorithm is so capable of doing its job. We need to know what are the components in such algorithm, right? So remember the positive indicators include six different ones. The first one is the names, mastery names. And the uh, gender, male, the age, somewhere between 26 and 35. And only a mobile phone, but not a land phone. And being a student and rent to your house. So these are the positive indicators for a terrorist inside the algorithm. And what are the other indicators? Well, there are some the so-called neutral indicators. Neutral indicators refers that they are not significant for use in the algorithm. But some people believe that they may be related to the algorithm for us to identify a terrorist. But according to Ian and Hosty, their research revealed that these three different indicators are not related. So they are one, the employment status. Whether they are employed or not is not relevant. So there's nothing related to this one. And the second one is marital status. Marital status refer whether he, this one is single, divorced, or married is not relevant either. Okay, and the way that it lives close to the mosque. Mosque is the worship shop, uh, worship place for the, uh, for, for, for the Muslims. It's like a church for Christian, right? So whether you live next door to the mosque or five miles away from mosque, it is not relevant. So the three indicators, a lot of people believe that they should be relevant, but actually, they are not. They are not related to the issue at all. Marriage, whether you are married or not, married or not, whether you are employed or not, or whether you live close to the mosque or not, they are not relevant. So we call them as the neutral indicators. They are not related to the algorithm. So actually in the algorithm, the, the three different neutral indicators are not included. They are not included at all, okay? So we have a positive indicators and neutral indicators. And also the last one is the negative indicators. So here we have the negative indicators revealed here. So what are the negative indicators mean here? It means that terrorists normally don't do this. If it, they do not have conduct such behaviors, normally they don't do this. One, normally they do not own a savings account. So what is the meaning of savings account here? Uh, in Taiwan, we have uh, Huo Chun and Ding Chun, right? So savings account is very similar to Ding Chun. And in uh, US, in the United States, we have a savings account and checking account. Checking, checking as account, you can write the check. It's more like a Huo Chun, and uh, savings account is very similar to Ding Chun, okay? However, there are still some differences. For example, if you have a savings account in the United States, normally you will be allowed to write checks on that savings account. 
you are allowed three checks per win per month. But there's another account called CD, Certified Deposit. CD is very similar to Ding Chun in Taiwan. CD. It means that you deposit your money into the bank, and then you are not allowed to withdraw. If you want to withdraw, you will get a penalty on your own interest. So CD in the United States is very similar to Taiwan's Ding Chun. But a savings account is somewhere between checking account and the CD is a little bit different. But, but it applies to the same phenomenon. That is, if you deposit your money inside savings account, the ability for you to withdraw money is a little bit limited. So if you are a terrorist, if you are a terrorist, normally you don't put your money into a savings account. Instead, you will put them into a checking account. Okay, that's a, that's a story. So a terrorist normally does not own a savings account. Most of the time, they would rather to transact, transact their cash, their money with cash, no more the time. Okay, the other one is they do not withdraw money from an ATM on a Friday afternoon. Strange, right? Because that is a mandatory worship time for them to worship Allah at that time. So Monday, <laughs> Friday afternoon, they have to worship on site. So they are not allowed to go to withdraw money. So basically, if you do not withdraw money from the ATM on every Friday afternoon, possibly you may be a terrorist. <laughs> you have to do that often. Come on, go to withdraw your money. $100 at a time is good enough to prevent identified, being identified by the police. And the third negative indicator is that terrorists do not buy life insurance. Okay, so w here we have the answers. That is, if you really want to be a terrorist as your own career, go buy a life insurance. And uh, preferably to open a savings account and also to withdraw some money from the, from from the ATM on every Friday afternoon. That would be good for you, right? So here we have a complete set. We have the complete set of the indicators that need to be included inside the algorithm. The positive one is here. These are the positive. If you, if you are a terrorist have these traits, it is highly likely that the chance of being a terrorist is increased. Okay? If a terrorist does not do this, then the probability of being a terrorist is increased. So these are the negative indicators. And these are the positive indicators. But how about this in the middle, in the between? They are irrelevant. So it does not matter. Whether, whether the person in the bank is employed, married, or living close, or very distant from the mosque, the distance is not an issue at all. So basically, the algorithm includes two sets of indicators, positive indicators and the negative indicators. These are the two sets of indicators that have been identified to be included inside the algorithm. Okay? And don't include this because they are irrelevant. But we say almost complete, almost complete, not yet. Because there's another thing here that is very mysterious, not identified yet by the public. It's a secret so far. No one knows for sure about the details. That is the so-called variable X. Variable X is the final key component make this algorithm so successful. 
with it. The security agency in the whole wide world feels very, very happy and very, very powerful. To some extent, they feel themselves omnipotent, full of power, omnipotent. Okay, so what about variable x? And remember, when we say variable x, it refers to the code name of this one. It's not really variable x, but something, something. We do not identify its name because we don't know the name, but we just call it as a variable x. Okay, what is the nature of variable x here? First one, it is a behavioral matrix. It measures the intensity of some kind of behavior. Let's look at all of these indicators here. All of these indicators are binary. It means yes or no. Is that right? Do you have masculine names? Yes or no. Are you a man? Yes or no, right? Are you in the age between 26 to 35? Yes or no. Do you own a mobile home? Yes or no. So basically all of these answer here is yes or no. And how about this? Having a savings account withdrawing money from an ATM, or buying life insurance, again, is yes or no. So all of these indicators are dichotomous, means only two answers. But for this one, variable x, it is a behavioral matrix. It measures the intensity of some kind of behaviors, some kind of banking behavior. So it, has, it is majorly in terms of one, two, three, four, five, the intensity. How intense of this behavior? It's different. It's not a matter of yes or no, but in terms of the scale, the scale, the intensity. The higher number of this variable x refers to the higher intensity of this behavior. Okay, so first one. So what is the function of this variable x? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just like a fly. One fly sitting on the wall of the room Inside the room is full of terrorists. So you can imagine this. This variable x is just like a fly. You know, this is a room, right? And just sitting here. And watching every terrorist in this room. <laughs> well, that's quite useful, right? And this fly is so small and no one, I, no one is uh, capable of identifying it. And with this fly, all the security agency in the whole wide world can observe these terrorists. Their actions, their conversation, their dialogues, their behaviors, right? So variable X is the fly sitting on the wall in the room full of terrorists. My goodness, such, so useful. That's why it needs to be hide from the it needs to be kept secret from the public, right? The last piece of the puzzle. Variable X, okay? So it is used to measure the intensity of particular banking activity. So far, we have no idea about what kind of banking activity it tries to measure. No answers yet, at least from the public source. No answer. Of course, there are a lot of guesses out there. The frequency of for you to withdraw money from the bank, uh, the, the, wire ch the frequency of the wiring money from one place to another place, maybe, right? Okay, so there's no definite answer yet. It will open to you, allow you to explore your answers by yourself in the assignments. But for now, let's continue. And uh, this variable X would occur in high intensities, much more frequently for those who have other terrorist markers. These are the markers. 
these are the markers, right? So if you have these markers and you behave so frequently in for on this behavior, variable X, then it's very highly likely you are the terrorist for sure. So wonderful. So this is the magic power for variable X. So imagine this. This is a fly in the room on the wall of the terrace. That's quite, quite amazing, right? So this one. And unfortunately, so far. So far, no one knows for sure about the nature of variable X. So far, we only know it is a behavior matrix. It is the way to measure the intensity of some kind or some particular banking activity. And no one knows for sure the nature, the real nature of this variable X. But it is useful. So all together, we, Yen and Hosty, combine these elements together, this one and this one, and without the magic power, and with the major power, magic power of variable X come out of the algorithm. And uh, Yen and Hosty with his team, Yen Hosty with his team, use the, as this algorithm to dredge through the other banking data and try to identify the potential terrorist just based on this. So if this project has been done a few years earlier than the bombing, July 7 bombing, then maybe, maybe some of the victims would have been saved. Is that right? Maybe a good idea. So here we have the algorithm. So is that so wonderful? So let's see the power. The power of this detection project. The power of this detection project is very, very amazing. Let's see this one. At the very beginning, there are millions or millions of bank customers in the bank. So starting with a database of millions of bank customers. And with this algorithm, with this detection project, Yen Hosley and his team were able to generate a list of 30 plus highly suspicious individuals. And these 30 out of millions, at least five of those 30 involved in some kind of terrorist activities. And remember, one thing, these terrorist, terrorists do not yet, have not yet conducted their terrorist activity yet, right? They are still hiding there, hibernating somewhere in the very corner of the London society. They are still there. They did not act at all, but they are already identified by the detection project. Okay, you will say five out of 30, 30 out of millions, uh, is that a big deal? It could be a big deal, right? It could be a big deal. And that is the power, the predicting power of the detection project. And what is good about this? Let's see this one. The only thing that is very amazing, without allowing them to really conduct their terrorist act, the authority is able to catch them in beforehand. That is quite a, an achievement. So you want to go through them one by one and ask them, hey, are you a terrorist? Oh, if you want to use the computing system and use the, this algorithm, automatically identify those potential terrorists out of on this bank customer's database. Of course, if I were them, I would like to use the same technique too, right? So this is great. Okay, any question? We have finished the text, the reading instruction. So basically, remember the purpose of English reading for international affairs is not English reading. It's not. 
The primary focus of this course is to get you some of the ideas about the nature of international affairs. But English is a tool. English is a tool. So you would be amazed to find out the approach of the lecture for this course is not lead you through the, all the different sentences. Let's read, let's memorize, let's know the structure of the norm. It's not the purpose of this course. This course is to orient you about the complexity and the beauty of international affairs. So you English, English is, is a tool to understand the interdisciplinary nature between among the international politics, international economics, and the international cultural studies. All combined together becomes the, what we have learned so far and what you ha are going to learn in the next four years, international affairs. So let's take a look about this lesson. Life insurance is a matter of finance, uh, is a matter of international part of the economic studies. But how about terrorist? Terrorist act can be related to cultural studies because there's always a conflict between different civilizations. Christian, Muslims, right? Their religions beliefs are different. And since their ideology are different, and then they focus on different things, different issues. When their ideologies and the values conflict with one another, then the war will be there. Then the terrorist will be there. The terrorist is regarded as terrorist by Western, by the West. But for their own countrymen, they are martyrs. They are heroes, right? So look here, the same people conducting with the same function, same actions, but they are regarded quite differently about the nature of their behaviors. Are they the martyrs of those fellow people or are they the terrorists of the other people? It's very difficult for you to make a judgment, right? So you see, when, you look, when we look at this very simple article here, we have to come up with some idea. It is not enough for you just to keep your the so-called single-sided perspective on everything. Everything has different faces. One thing has many, many different faces. You have to look at the same thing with multiple perspectives. Multiple perspectives. Okay? So when we say that Ian Hosley, of course, they and his team, they have their they have their positions to take. They are British. But how about those terrorists? They didn't they are not British. They are they do not believe in the same religion. They do not practice the same culture. But they are living together. And uh, one violated, breasted the bomb, and they are identified as the terrorists. But the one who tries to defend their own homeland, they are hero. So there is a lot of complicated, complicated issues out there for us to think. So this is the first lesson for you to think about the nature of international affairs. It's not straightforward. It's very difficult for you to make a value judgment. Values are so different. Look at us. We are from different generations, right? I'm now 62. How old are you? Less than, than 20, most of you, right? Most of you, less than 20. So think about this. Can our value system just be the same? Of course not, definitely not, right? But remember, we're all from Taiwan. Most of the students are from Taiwan. I'm from Taiwan too. But why, why is that our very system is different? Very simple. The process of our socialization is different. Then, here, what is socialization? What is socialization? 
社会化。What is that? What does we mean about socialization? Everyone is educated through different process, through your family, your peers, your school education, and your government and the media. So basically, if you look at your family, peers, schools, government, and the media, these five major actors for the socialization of becoming you. Everyone is different. Our educational system, when I was a, my educational system, when I was a child, is very different from yours. Is that right? Through my educational system, I have my unique value and judgment and norms. Through your educational system, you have yours. That's different. This is only in Taiwan. But how about the people, the students from different countries? Some students from Japan, from America, from Canada, and from Egypt, and from Vietnam. Do they do they have the same value system at all? No, definitely not. Right? So we see the case here, July seventh, two thousand five. The four bombers, suicide bombers, blasting themselves out there. The single incident. It is a terrorist attack, or it is a martyr action, trying to have a jihad. Everything is for sacred God. It's very difficult to judge, right? So, the first of all, to becoming a student of international affair, we have to become objective. As much as possible, don't have, don't need to have a so-called misconception or prejudice upon something. Say this must be something. No, that is not the idea. We have to become as objective as possible. Okay, so for now, let's try to do this. Okay, so let's move to the other part: etymology and uh, sentence structure. The first one is the etymology. Etymology, as I have indicated in the beginning of the class, it is the most efficient way of learning English vocabulary. I guarantee you, it is. It is. And it is very important for you to learn this、uh, the so-called Latin and Greek roots of English words. So let's see this one. This tiny sentence actually consists a lot of Latin roots. So instead of remember these words, suspicious, characters, accommodated, detection, project, or arrested, instead of remember these words, why not use Latin roots or Greek roots to know their meanings? So let's try. To get to this approach, let's take a look at this one. Suspicious. Suspicious refers to some different issues. One sub. Combined with a sus, sus is sub. And how about spic? Spic. The root is spec. Spec refers to see, look, observe. Okay, with this tiny knowledge, what can we do to increase our knowledge for English vocabulary? Okay, let me give you something. For example, first of all, spect. How about that's、uh, inspect? Inspect. What does this mean? We have to. We have to look inside. In refers in. So if you inspect something, you check on it, you examine it, 检查 okay, inspect because you look into it. How about you respect it? Now we have another word with respect. So if you respect 
someone, it means you look upon him again and again. Re refers to again and the back. So you look back to someone, can I do this? And you look back to someone, you want his agreement, consent. You will need his nodding his head, so you respect. But if you expect, let's say expect, the same thing. It acts means out. Out, what does this mean? If you expect someone, you look out. You look out refers, wow. If you really look out from the window, look out the window to see something, you are really expecting something, right? So you qi expect. And the other one is very simple. Let's, for example, this one, we have an EX means out, right? How about exit? Exit. We have a, the word here, right? Exit. Have you ever thought about that this is actually a combination of two roots? Two roots. EX means out. How about IT? IT means to go. So exit, this is something you go out. That's exit, okay? Exit. So there are a lot of words you can know. For example, IT, IT and ITI refers to the same thing. Mean IT and ITI, ITI refers to to go, okay? So how about itinerary? With uh, an ERY, itinerary, a travel plan, a travel plan for you to go, right? Itinerary. <laughs> so if you know this, that you can learn a lot of different words. So you can turn to the few pages after this, you will know there's uh, the vocabulary list over there, right? Let's take a look. So if you see on uh, page 12, there are vocabulary for lesson one, is that right? You can see this? Vocabulary for lesson one, and I have tried to identify most of the possible vocabularies for you already over there. So let's go through the vocabulary list, and you will understand the structure of my layout. First of all, you have, uh, for example, accommodate. Accommodate, the first one, right? Accommodate and the pronunciation, the punctuation of there, accommodate, it is a verb, is that right? And also I provide you the English definition to consider and include something where you are deciding what to do. And also for the convenience of Taiwanese students, we have a Chinese meaning over here. So this is the meaning. And uh, following, we have uh, add, to add, come, and mold. And you see this, uh, there's a straight line over there, right? Somewhere the mold is the root, the add, and the come is the prefix. And the last part, at, A-T-E, is the suffix. So I also provide you the meaning for those roots, so that you are able to learn. Understand the meaning of the English word. Okay, so that could be helpful. And of course, it requires your own time to study. But that would be very, very helpful. And remember, the most commonly used Latin roots, English roots, there are only 400, around 400. So with the 400 of English roots, 
you are able to master 40,000 English words. So remember, it will be much better for you to work on this instead of memorizing this, right? You don't need to remember. When I was, uh, when, I wa when I first learned English, and uh, most of my teacher would always advise me to remember words from the dictionary, but that is quite a waste of the time. Indeed, waste of the time. It would be more efficient for you to work on the English roots only. And with this knowledge, it will be able to help you to understand. Okay, so let's look at this one more time. We have sub and uh, spect refers to C, right? So what is suspicious refers to the meaning of the root. Of OUS refers to of. Of looking under something. Of looking under. If you believe in something, you just look at that, right? If you suspect something, you will look at what is under the table. There must be some strange stuff over there. That's why you want to look under. Look under, you want to see what's behind the desk, what's under the desk, right? That is a suspect. Suspect is the verb. Suspect is the verb or the noun, suspect. Suspect, you look under. Suspect, you are looked under. You are the person being looked under by the police. So you are suspect. If you suspect, you are doing the action of looking under. So that is a verb, okay? So let's move to the other one, character. Character, actually, the whole character is a Latin root. It refers to engraved mark. Something heavily marked on the stone. Character. Something significant to work put on the stone or the wood, of the or the wood. So, have you ever heard about the Chinese word? We have an English and a Chinese word. Chinese word is called as Chinese character, but not Chinese word. Why Chinese character? <laughs> because Chinese character is something like this. Some is always like you are carving on the wood, right? Carve, character, carve. Okay, so we have to work on the Chinese character. It's not English, English alphabet. We have a lot of different character over there. So if you are very unique, you are with full of uh, nature, full of the characteristics, so you are such a character, right? You are the main actor of the play, then you are the main character. So character refers to something that is uniquely existing over there. Okay, so let's move to accommodate. Accommodate, AC come out from AD. This is a prefix. Prefix root and a suffix. Prefix root and a suffix. And this prefix to AD refers to to or to word. So let's see. There's a, one word let me give you. <clears throat> what is at here? And here is to AD, whoops, AD is to, right? Here is here. So add here is to attach. The to here. So if you put something to here, you attach at here. Okay? And how about advance? You go forward, right? Vent means V-E-N-T, to come, come forward. 
So it's very easy, very easy, advance. Okay, and the calm refers to, there are several meanings for calm. Calm is also a prefix. Prefix, what's? So we have calm, it means same together or along with. So to come together, we measure something together. We measure something together that is a common date to your need, a common date. For example, if you visit the home and the host accommodate your needs, provide the, you something for you to feel comfortable, that is accommodate. Or if you want to uh, tailor to some specific project, you accommodate their needs. So accommodate is to adapt. How can you adapt? You, may, you need to measure them together. So this is a common date. And uh, the other one, let's say detection. The meaning of detection is to identify, it, right? So the verb here is detect, detect. And let's see why it is detect, to investigate, to explore, to open something. Because T-E-C-T -E is to cover. So when you de Tact, it means you uncover. If you uncover something, you identify, you make it open. Yeah, it can be, yes, yes. You can have two roots in one word, of course. For example, let me give you one. Okay. Oh, this is a big word. Anthropology. What what is what is the meaning of anthropology? It's very difficult, right? But for me it's I really don't remember this. I don't really did not memorize this word because I always treat this as two roots. Okay, one is anthrop. The other one is allergy. Anyone here can tell me the meaning of allergy? The study of, so this is, must be the study of something, right? Okay, let's see. We human beings are anthropoid. Let me tell you, we human beings are anthropoid. <laughs> so it seems that anthrop should be related to human being, right? Should be related to human. But actually, yes, indeed. Because when we say anthrop is human. So anthropo anthropology is the, the study of human. That, that's it. That's it. <laughs> no, no mystery, right? So the study of human is anthropology. So how about anthropoid? Anthrop, oh, we know this is about human. But how about ID? ID is like. A group alike. So anthropoid include monkey, chimpanzee, <laughs> and, and human. So we are part of the anthropoids. Okay, so we are. So basically by learning this, these are the two roots, anthropology. So look here, anthropology, because we know ology is the study of, right? How about the study of mind? Psychology, right? Okay, psychology. How about thermology? Uh, thermology. Thermology. Thermo, the study of heat. Thermo. Then let me tell you the other one. Okay, let's use thermometer. 
And anyone here know the meaning of thermometer? Okay, actually they come out from two different roots, thermo and meter. Oh, thermo and meter. Thermo means heat, heat. This one refers to heat. So thermo is heat. Meter is something for measurement. So what is thermometer? Thermometer refers to a tool to measure your heat. Wen Du Ji, is that right? Meter refers to measurement. Okay, since we know meter, it refers to measurement, right? Let me give you one another one. What is odometer? Odometer must be related to something for measurement, right? Then we need to know what is the meaning of auto. Auto is speed, <laughs> speed. So odometer is the speed meter in your car. Li Chenji odometer. So you see, basically, if you know the route, it will be allow you allowing you will be allowed to use those the knowledge of those routes to expand your vocabulary archive. Okay. So let's uh, move on to this one. Any more question? So here detection we say, we try to uncover something, right? So that's why we investigate or we inspect. And a project, project pro means forward or before. Jacked refers to throw, throw away. So what is the meaning of project? If it is a noun, it's something throw before you. Hey, Daniel, this is something I want to do. I want to do project. So this is my project. But if this is a verb, project, it means predict. It means that you try to do something. So you throw something in advance. Throw something, right? But how about re? Reject. What about reject? You throw something back. I don't want it. So you throw something back. That is the reject. Reject is, reject is the synonym for refuse, right? Refuse. What is refuse? Refuse is a reject. Reject come out from throwing something back. But how about refuse? Refuse is mix back. You give that to me, I mix together and then back to you. Fuse, F-U-S, mix. So mix something back to you. <laughs> I don't want it, refuse. Okay, so it, it, it's very interesting to know those words. You will know, oh, oh, the meaning of this word it come out from the roots. So basically for now, me, I seldomly check out, check up the dictionary when I read English articles, seldom. Why? Because I know the meaning of the roots. Even though I never encountered the new words before, I can use the knowledge of the English etymology to understand the meaning of those English words. Unless the word is so short, so uniquely English, <laughs> native English, then I have no way, I have to check. If this is a combination of words, most of the time I never needed to check it up from the dictionary. You can do that too. It, it, it's very, very interesting to know, to know one thing. The more complicated the word is, the longer it is, the easier for me to understand because it is always combined with roots. But the simple ones, Three words, or just two words, some, uh, I mean letters, three letters or, or four letters. This, can, this words come out from the native English. Sometimes it's very, very difficult for me to know. I have to check out from this, because there's no root at all. No root. Okay, so project, you see, jacked refers to throw, right? So if you throw something 
before, in ahead of you, you project, you predict something. And now I say predict, right? Predict is to forecast. And let's say, what is the meaning of predict? Uh, let's have a 10 minutes break for now. Okay, take your seat. We'll begin to about to begin our class in 10 seconds. So as you can see from here, the purpose of teaching you English etymology and later the logical grammar is for you to sharpen your the tool for using English. Okay? So remember, whenever you want to learn something, there are always efficient ways of learning and a very dumb way of learning. And this is the efficient way for you to learn English vocabulary. So use that. Okay? Try to change your habit. You will appreciate that this indeed can help you a lot. For example, arrest. Arrest is to stop something, to get back something, to, rem to keep someone behind. So if you arrest someone, you stop him. And how about just no, you may rest now. <laughs> you may just lay down, <laughs> rest, stop. You may stop now, you rest now. Okay, so by remembering, by trying to uh, work on the different uh, roots, you will be able to combine the meaning of the roots. Okay? For example, the one I told you, anthropology, right? So basically, I only use two units for memory. And let me give you some idea about the memory unit. This one. Let's pop up these words one more time. Okay, there are many different ways for you to remember the word anthropology. The most, most efficient way is to remember the words by letters. A-N-T-H-R-O-P-O-L-O-G-Y and A-N-T-H-R-O-P-O-L-O-G-Y. Oh, this is anthropology, so you remember that. But how many memory units here we talk about? They are one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve, right? So you have to spend twelve units or me 12 memory units to memorize these words. And the words is that A-N-T-H-R-O-P-O-L-O-G-Y, they themselves have no meaning at all. A, just A. N, just N, right? So most of the students here do not use it this way to memorize words anymore, unless you are a kid, a kindergarten. Apple, A-P-P-L-E, Apple, then everyone is shouting out loud, A-P-P-L-E, Apple, five memory unit, right? But starting from a very intriguing time, sometime before you have learned English for a while, and your teacher will say, hey, you could remember with the words with syllabus. Syllabus, right? So let's use syllabus to remember uh, anthropology. So look here. We have anthropology, five syllabus. Is that right? We have five syllabus to memorize. So it seems that we have made some progress because now we need only to use five memory units memory units to remember the words anthropology phi. But here comes another issue. Yes, indeed, we have progressed from 12 to 5, right? When we use 12 letters to remember anthropology, each of the 12 letters carries no meaning at all. 
But now we use five syllabus. Then each syllabus has the sound, the correlation to the word. It seems we have progress a little bit, right? But remember, what is the meaning of an? We do have an. N. Can we use an to e understand and? They, they are very similar, right? But they do not belong. They do not belong. So actually, most of the students here, just like you, you remember words by syllabus. Is that right? It's great, but far less efficient. Because each syllabus has no meaning. Each syllabus has no meaning. But now I introduce you the mostly efficient way of using roots to memorize words. Why? Look here. When we say anthropology now, I was able, I am able to downsize the memory unit to only two. Anthropo and ology. There are only two memory units. Very simple. And the best of all is that each memory unit has meaning. We know this is human, and we know this is the study of. So why not just remember the study of human, human, <laughs> by only memorize two memory units. We, our brains are so small, right? So we want to use our brain for the most efficient approach. We use two memory units to, to memorize anthropology. And also, we can use this meaningful unit to expand our vocabulary ability to a lot of different words. Anthropophobia. <laughs> Have you ever heard about this name, this term? Anthropophobia. Let me put another one. Put over here. Anthropophobia. The fear of human being. Phobia is extreme fear. That's it. Two units. You don't have to remember A-N-T-H-R-O-P-O or P-H-O-B-I-A and you are afraid to spell it wrongly. But why not just use anthropophobia? And we have anthropophobia. Let me give you another word. How about acrophobia? What is the meaning for acrophobia? A fear, this is a fear, right? Phobia is a fear. And how about acro? Air. Height. So, Basically, a fear of height is acrophobia. Is that right? And how about hydrophobia? Hydrophobia. Hydrophobia refers to a fear of water. Hydro, water. Hydro. So how about dehydrate? There's another word. Dehydrate. It seems to be a very, very sophisticated word, but actually it comes out from three different memory units. One is D. D, did you see this one? On or off, right? And the other one is ATE. Did you see this one? Uh, eight here to do or make, right? And how about hydro? Hydro is this one. So what is the dehydrate to make water away? That's it. To make water away, that's it. Not a mystery, okay? So instead of remember dehydrate three syllables, it seems very powerful, right? But the the high trait carry no meaning, only sound. But now we can move us a little bit forward to memorize the meaning. D away, hydro, water, 
it do or make, right? So we make the water away. We get the water away. If you are dehydrated in the desert, you will die, right? Dehydrated because your water are flowing away. So we can use this to increase a lot of words. <laughs> Okay, so we don't want to have uh, acrophobia or hydrophobia. We don't want to have a uh, learn no ophobia, the, the 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 fear to to learn. <laughs> so you you can be fine. You can be fine. Just use roots. Okay. So remember, when we learn something, we are using actually we are using our memory units. Everyone's ability of of Handling the memory units are, is different. But there's a very good rule for this. That is, if we can use less, fewer memory units to memorize things, the better. So in this regard, we can use two memory units to memorize anthropology with meaning. Anthro, human. Allergy, the study of, right? So anthropology is there, we know. Instead of memorize five syllables, anthropology. No meaning, complicated. Why do you want this approach? The worst of all, fortunately for us, we don't use that anymore, right? So we can compare five and two. Five without meaning, two with a lot of meaning, and those meaningful combination, combination can be used to apply to another words. So why don't we use this? You will be amazed to find out you are so powerful. You are so omnipotent. So I tell you, I will love to tell you one more time. Now, I seldom use dictionary. When I read English, seldom unless the word is very uniquely English. Unless, there's no roots at all. Most of our academic books have roots, a lot of roots out there. Most of the words in academic books are consistent of words, out of roots. So let's learn English roots, okay? This is a good way, right? So now is a good time for you to expand your knowledge horizon. Okay, let's move up to the second part, understanding sentence structure. Why? We need to have this. Because the, it is the most efficient way of learning English grammar. <laughs> Indeed, I guarantee you. If you know the sentence structure and you can handle most of the grammatical issues, you can write good sentences, create good sentence structure, and so on. Okay. Let's look at this. A flock of suspicious characters accommodated our terrorist detection project. One very simple question for you, and it is also a roll call. What is this? A flock of suspicious characters accommodated our terrorist detection project. All of the answers you provided on our nine groups are wrong. My goodness, how can that be? I have learned English grammar so for my life, and you tell me I am wrong. How can that be? Because you are wrong. Because you are using a wrong grammatical perception in writing your sentence. The subject for this one, for this sentence, is only one word. That is, flock. That's it. No more, no less. You may argue, hey, wait a moment. I have learned so far, it says a flock of suspicious characters should be the subject. No? Not really. Let me explain that to you, okay? Do you see this one? When you say, I say flock, I say flock is the, let me, let me use another way to, I say flock is the subject. And you say a flock of suspicious character is the subject. And I say you are wrong. Why? 
because let's look at this characters what kind of characters is suspicious characters right so characters is modified by suspicious this is adjective but this combined together is after the preposition of so we say this of suspicious characters is a prepositional phrase and this this of suspicious characters is used to modify the noun flock since it is used to modify fuck, so this one prepositional phrase is functioned, functional is an adjective, right? And the uh, indefinite article a uh, is used to modify flock. So the only noun here that is capable of being the subject is flock. Of suspicious characters, is an adjective phrase to modify flock. A uh, is used to modify flock. So basically, we can take this away without harming the structure. Is that right? So flock is the subject. It's very difficult to imagine for now. OK, next. The verb. Of course, it's accommodate, right? Accommodated. Then tell me, which one is the object for the sentence? Which one is the object? We have the actor subject, flock, right? We have the verb accommodated. Then tell me, what is the noun to receive the action of accommodate? Which one? Which one is the, we have, of course, we have the candidate here, right? Then tell me, which one is the subject? So here we can do this one more time. So look here. We have flock as the subject. And we have accommodated as the verb, right? This is the action verb. So action verb, we have the project. So flock accommodate project then what is the project what the project is it is a terrorist detection project so basically this noun is used to modify project is that right and then whose terrorist detection project our is used to modify so basically the most important components for this sentence is flock accommodated project. You cannot take this any one of the three away. If you take any of the three away, then it is not a sentence. Is that right? For example, you cannot of suspicious character accommodate out. No, there's no subject. Or if you say a flock of suspicious character accommodate our terrorist detection, nothing. No object. OK. So now we know the sentence structure only consists of three major components. Subject, flock, verb, transitive verb, accommodated, and the object, project. So how can we know it is in this way? OK. Here, we call sentence diagramming. S <coughs> sentence diagramming allow you to understand the structure of the sentence. Not all the words in one sentence are equally important. No, not at all. Okay, so let me give you some idea about the sentence diagramming. And this is very important for you to know. This, first of all, we have the main nine. The main nine indicate the main structure that need to put on. This is the main nine. And this vertical nine going through the main nine divide the subject and the verb. And there's a shorter vertical nine here divided two components. The 
chance verb and the object. Okay, so look here, flock accommodated project. The three words above the same line cannot be taken away in any how. Because if you take any one of the three away from the main line, then the structure, the grammar, grammatical structure of the sentence is broken. Then how about the other words? We say of suspicious character. Did you see this one? Of suspicious character. The combination here is used to modify flock. A uh, is used to modify flock. So basically of character, of suspicious character can be taken away without harming the structure. So basically of suspicious characters is a modifier Modifier, just like a decoration on the wall, is a paint, is a picture on the wall. The picture can be taken away without harming the wall, right? You don't need to have the picture over here to call this as a classroom. But the classroom has to be here. You can put a lot of pictures over there. And they are all modifiers. They are decorations, right? So look here. When we say this is a modifier, can we expand the modifier a little bit? Yes, of course. Let me give you a very, very long sentence. And still, it is a very short structure. Flock accommodated project. Let me give you one. A flock of strange and suspicious characters who come from India and China accommodate our de terrorist detection project. Remember that I have added a lot of words over here, right? See, let me say that one more time. A flock of suspicious and uh, strange characters who come out, who came from China and India, who have learned, earned a master's degree from Taiwan, they are used to modify terrorists, right? But, but it's just a fancy picture. All of these added words are not related to the main structure of the sentence. Is that right? Because they are decoration, can be taken away, can be taken away. So you have to nurture the ability to identify the major components of the sentence. For this one, there are only three words. Flock accommodated project. Okay, let me give you another sentence. I will, I will say it right now. Daniel Lin, who is the most teacher lao I have ever seen, ever. So uh, let's see this sentence. Daniel Lin, who is my, who is the most teacher lao I have ever seen before, is now teaching me. So now take a look. What is the primary component for the sentence? Daniel Lin, who is the most teacher lao I have ever seen before, is now teaching me. So basically, Daniel Lin is teaching me, is the most important component, right? But what about the function of who is the most teacher lao I have ever seen ever? It's a modifier. It's used to modify Daniel Lin. Can we take that? the modifier away, yes, of course. Can we add in more components to the modifier? Yes, we can. For example, Daniel Lin, who is the most teacher lao shi I have, not, I have seen ever, and also the oldest teacher I have before, is now teaching me. 
See? I have a much longer sentence, right? But still, the primary component is Daniel Lin is teaching me. And if you want to add in more components, of course, Daniel Lin, who is now teaching me, uh, who is the most teacher, te teacher teacher I have ever seen, as the oldest teacher I have ever had, is now teaching me the poor student in Wenzhou. Can we do that? Yes, of course. But with all the modifiers, with all the decorations, they are all irrelevant. They are used only, only used to modify. The most important component is Daniel Lin is teaching me. You cannot take away of this. If you take away this major component, then you have no sentence. Is that right? So you now get the idea, right? So for now, I just give you a very simple idea. Learning grammar is not about memory. Actually, you don't need to memorize all the rules that you have learned before. You don't. You don't. The most important skills for you is to identify the structure. The key components of the structure in one sentence. And the structure, the structure, the important components of the structure is closely related to the sentence patterns. The sentence pattern for this one is verb is subject, transitive verb, and object, right? This is one of the sentence patterns you have learned before. Is that right? Very simple. Very simple. So don't get confused about the long sentences. They are all very simple. If you can dissect, put them into such sentence diagramming. If you can do this, of course, you will learn this in this class. But for now, I just give you some idea. Learning English grammar is not difficult at all. Not difficult. You know, when I did my TOEFL test before, I earned the full score in grammar. I'm not good at memory, but I'm very good at understanding the logic of grammar. I'm very good at that. Because I know it is in the way. Grammar is to be used, but not to be memorized. OK, very simple. Grammar is to be used. It has to fit to human's nature, but not something there for you to memorize, to torture you. No, on the contrary, it's not in the case. So if you look at this, a frog, a commendated object, project, that's it, subject, transitive verb, and object. Very simple, right? So gradually, we will, I will give you more understanding about the structure. And I hope that you know it's a good time for you to get rid of the old habit of remember the rules of grammars. They are all wrong and misleading. Just waste your time. Because I never try to remember the rule. And I'm very good at grammar. I assure you, I'm really good at grammar because I know the structure. OK, so now let's move to the assignments part. This is a subject, transitive verb, and object, right? Subject and the object. That's it. OK, let's go to uh, assignment number one. For this one, we have three assignments. The first one is you have to work with your teammates to identify the variable x referred in the algorithm, Ian Hosley's algorithm. And uh, you should go on website, Google search, the meaning, how people talk about variable X in this case. Okay? Variable X. It's a code name and it's something you have to work on. And remember, you team leaders have to uh, uh, gather your members and figure out a time and the venue to talk about this. You can do this online, you can do this in person, but you need to spend at least one hour to work together to review the context of the lecture today and also work on the assignments. And remember, 
you are discussing on the three different assignments are for you to brainstorm in your ideas, but not for you to create one single, single answer so you can co copy and pass for everyone. No, you are not allowed to do this. You can discuss. You can exchange ideas, but eventually you have to write out your own answers on assignment one, two, and three. You have the book, right? And remember, you have to write your draft answer here. Okay? You have to write your draft answer here. And next week, we will start our class for a quiz, quiz number one, and uh, to test your understanding of our uh, lecture. In the time for you to take, you, you're taking the quiz, Professor Xie will check on your note taking. So he would expect that you have uh, answers of here, and also you have answers on page 18. There is a code, uh, the section called synonym challenge, right? You have to take on the answer. You, and uh, you have to go through the different synonym to, uh, to try yourself. Of course, there are answers provided at the bottom of page 21. So don't look at the answers first. Finish your task first and uh, to check your answers. And then you have to finish your TOEFL question. There are 40 over there, over here. Uh, starting from page 22, to page 24. On the bottom of page 24, there are answers for the 40 TOEFL questions too, right? So you have to do that. And uh, let's move to TOEFL question. Let's go. Uh, uh, the first, the question for one to 10 is multiple questions. You just choose the one that is right. And how about 11 to 40? There are Oh, no, I'm sorry, uh, not 11, uh, it's uh, 16 to 40. There are four underlined words, right? For example, number 16 on page 23. The outer layer of the heart, called the pericardium, forms a sac in what the heart lies. There are four underlined words. Which one is wrong? You make a, your own choice, okay? You got it? Okay, so you finish yourself learning and uh, you can check your answers and also put your, the score, how many are correct? Put the number on the top of page 22 and put the date of your practice. And after you finish the 40 different practice questions, you must have puzzles. Even though you have the answer, but you still have no idea about why it is in this way. Okay? I believe that you must have. And then you are encouraged. After we have our quiz in the beginning, uh, in, in, uh, when we start our next class, we will use 20 minutes of the time for you to answer the questions. Answer the qu question for quiz one. And we will use another 20 to 30 minutes to allow you to ask your question about the 40 different TOEFL tests. The way for you to pop up your, end, your question is very simple. You could only, I will ask, only ask you to type the number of your questions on our, our night group. When I say you should, you are allowed to pop up the, end, the questions number, you just type in your number. For example, if you have a question on 16, you just type 16, one, six, that's it. And I will answer them one by one until the time we finish our first class, first session. You are encouraged to do so. And remember, if you go through the 40 questions, I, I'm quite sure that some of them are very, very intriguing. You have no clue at all. Just ask me. And whenever you ask one question in the class, 
you will be awarded for zero point uh, zero point two five score for your semester score. 零点二五分 each question. Okay, so it's a good time, good chance for you to earn some bonus. And uh, your question has ever can ever beat me. I cannot answer you. You get two points. Okay, two points for your semester score. Remember that is a semester score. That's a quite a lot, right? So you can do that. I am waiting for your challenge. Okay, so. So remember, you have to take notes, and uh, by the time you are taking your quiz next time, Professor Xie will check on your notes and give you a score. Okay, remember that. So remember, you have to work on work with your teammates to identify variable x, and uh, it's very important never copy and paste, and provide only one answer for all the members. You are not allowed to do that. You are encouraged to discuss together, and you are required to write your answers alone. Okay, can you do that? Okay, try to avoid plagiarism in any way. The first assignment, and the next assignment is about big data. We, big data is a fa very fancy word today, right? So we can see Yen Hosley did is to mine variable information from the huge amount of Hakka customers' banking records. So basically, this kind of customer banking records is actually a kind of big data. So we have to dig out the information from the big data. So now, your mission here is to work with your team member to illustrate at least 10 useful comments that you can type in the Google search column and ask the Google search engine to work for you. There are a lot of fancy keywords you can use in the Google search. Try to find it out. So you need to provide 10 different sets of comments by using Google search. For example, uh, have you ever heard the novel, The Animal Farm? Anyone here know the book written by George Orwin? Animal Farm, right? If you want to explore Animal Farm, then I, for example, you would like to read the book for Animal Farm. Yeah, and you may just simply type Animal Farm and a PDF, then you will have the animal farm in the PDF format for you. But how about you, if you want to listen to the recording of animal farm, you could animal farm and with MP3. That's it, very simple, very simple. So there are a lot of different keywords you can use. Try to think about this, at least a 10 set. Google the king of information, no doubt. Okay, so you have better use it well and in a very efficient way. The first step is for you to understand, actually, you can use a lot of comments to make Google search to work for you. Okay, so this is assignment number two. And number three is a little bit more demanding for you. Samuel Huntington in the Clash of Civilization indicated that conflicts now were most likely to occur between the world's largest eight major civilizations, namely Western, Latin American, Islamic, Cynic, Hindu, Orthodox, Japanese, and the African. So this story in lesson one described in this reading somehow suppose Huntington's argument. We see the conflict between Christianity and Muslim, right? It seems close. So now I want you to think about the question seriously. Have cultural rifts, cultural difference, cultural conflicts become the locus of wars 
If we want to have a war now, it is because of the cultural difference. The answer can be yes, no, uncertain, not so sure. But the point here is that, how do you think? So what you need to do is to look at the question seriously and to determine your position, whether you agree or disagree. And uh, you have to provide the reasons saying why you agree or why you do not agree. Okay? Again, you are encouraged to discuss, but you are required to write your own answers. Any questions so far? So remember, you have to write down the three assignments by yourself. Okay? And the context for our quiz consists of five vocabulary words. You have to identify the roots and the meaning of those words. And the two essay questions. Those two essay questions come out from the three assignments. Okay? So you have to prepare. So basically, whatever you have learned in the class, will become part of your quiz by next, next class, okay? So do you have any questions so far? If not, before we, I dismiss you, I will send an evaluation form to the leaders of each team, of the team leaders. And the team leaders are responsible to evaluate the performance of your team members. So you have to register their performance, their attendance and the participation in the Google form. And then I will evaluate your action on your evaluation. So basically, I will evaluate the team leaders. The team leaders will evaluate your members and each participation of your team discussion consists of one point of your semester score. Okay? So there's always an evaluation system over there. You are, men, you are required to attend. It's not a free choice. You need to attend. Okay, any question? So the leaders, you will be receiving a Google form from me later, the end of the day. Okay, and then I will, bye, and then thank you for coming today, thank you. Don't you say thank you? Thank you, thank you. yes, that's a good way to be, become courteous.